God who keeps his promise. Praise the Son who calls us friends. Praise the Spirit who among us to our hopes and fears.
which the kingdom comes Sent by the Lord am I My hands are ready now To make the earth a place In which the kingdom comes Oh, the angels cannot change A world of hurt and pain Into a world of love Of justice and of peace The task is mine to do Is to set it really free
Hello and welcome to this time of worship together for this first Sunday in February in 2023. I'm Bonnie Bell Pickard, the superintendent of the North Kent Methodist Circuit, and happy to be worshiping with you today. As you'll probably be aware, during our liturgical year, which starts with Advent, each each year we study a different gospel writers. Uh, remembrances of what happened in Jesus' life. And this year we're going through Matthew's gospel. You will remember perhaps that we looked at the four women that are named in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus um, during the, the Sundays of Advent. And now we're coming into the season where we look more carefully at Jesus' ministry. And, and so we're, we're looking at the beginning parts of his ministry in these, these days right now. We'll be looking at the Beatitudes. We'll be looking at some of the Sermon on the Mount. I'd like to share this verse as well, which doesn't come from Matthew's Gospel, but from the book of Micah. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Keeping those thoughts in mind, we'll begin our worship this morning, singing hymn number uh, 28 from Singing the Faith. And that is God, Jesus calls us here to meet him. Indeed, in this space, even though we're perhaps uh, scattered geographically in this space, in this online space today, we worship together. So join with me in singing.
the words from the second verse of that hymn, tell his holy human story, tell his tales that all may hear, tell the world that Christ in glory came to earth to meet us here. Reminding us again, God is interested in our particular situation and how we might respond to be building God's kingdom right here, right where we are. As I said earlier, we're looking at Matthew's gospel this year. And the last few weeks we begin, we've been uh, following the beginning of, of Jesus' ministry. We started out by hearing about John the Baptist preaching at the Jordan River, calling people to repent, how Jesus himself was baptized by John. And then he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, being tested and tried, presumably testing his colleague to understand, understand better what God had for him to do. And of course, we'll be exploring that time in the wilderness a little bit more next month during the time of Lent. We remember how Jesus returned from the wilderness to Nazareth, his hometown, as it were, to begin his ministry. But then he heard that John had been arrested. And I think that made him stop and think again, what are the real dangers of my ministry? And yet, what do I need to persevere in? John was probably, well, we know he was arrested because King Herod wasn't very happy with what he was saying. Indeed, John was telling even the king that the king needed to repent. Uh, in this particular time, the situation was that the king had taken over his brother's wife. And John was saying that that's not right. That's not right. And that hadn't gone down too well in the royal circles. Uh, being a prophet has its liabilities. One can get oneself into trouble. Any case, when, when Jesus hears that John has been arrested, he decides to leave Nazareth. He withdraws into Galilee and he goes a little bit further north. He goes further uh, up to the top of the Sea of Galilee in the furthest northern region, actually, of, of Israel at that time, going further away from Jerusalem in the political unrest, um, going up to the place of Naphtali and Zebulun, the place that was known as Gentiles. So non-Jews were predominantly there, but there were some Jewish settlements, especially around the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus goes to Capernaum, which was in the northern shore of Lake Galilee. And it was, again, it was about as far as one could go to get away from Jerusalem and still be in the land of Israel. Capernaum, like many other of the seaside towns around Galilee, was a fishing town. And it was on an important trade route called the Via Maris, so the road to the sea, the road that led to the sea. And so it would have been on an important trade route, as I said. Capernaum's fishing business was heavily dependent on that trade route because the climate in Capernaum was hot and it was below sea level. And apart from the freshwater lake, it was fairly dry and, and hot. And the fish that would have been caught would have rotted quickly. So they needed either to get them to market very quickly on this Via Maris or they needed to preserve the fish. And the best way they did it was salting them down heavily and making a kind of fish paste out of it called garum, which was a bit like ketchup. So that was big business in, in, Gal in Capernaum. And Capernaum was a fairly, it wasn't an affluent town, but it was, it was getting along. It was doing all right. Um, it was also a place where there was a lot of influx of the news. So people coming and going from this Via Maris. And when there's a lot of news coming and going, then people hear about things like um, John the Baptist, like Jesus' ministry. Being a fishing town, it also meant that there was a great need for a lot of infrastructure in the village. There would have been customs officials, there would have been taxmen, there would have they would have needed people to make and repair boats and nets and sails, they would have needed lead weights, they would have needed anchors, they would have needed floats and hooks and ropes and baskets. 
So all of that infrastructure, all of those people to make and repair those items would have been needed. And of course, wherever you've got people gathering like that, then they will talk as well on a regular basis. We know that Jesus was a, a carpenter. And at least I had usually thought that perhaps being a carpenter, he was doing woodwork within a house, perhaps even building houses, but more likely building furniture. But when we hear about Capernaum, we begin to think, well, maybe he was a boat builder. And if so, he would have been very connected with all those people providing the fishing infrastructure in that town. He would have been in touch with the tax men as well. So we start thinking about this context and we think it's not so unusual that people started knowing about Jesus and coming to see. We know though from Matthew's gospel that what really attracted people to Jesus in the beginning was his ability to heal. And this was very important in those days. Uh, medical care was very, very limited. Very few doctors, and even if there were doctors around, they were very expensive. So really only the most wealthy people could afford to have a doctor. But still, people got ill. There was much illness around. There was a lot of malaria, for instance. And Jesus, though we don't understand exactly how, but he was able to heal people. And uh, so people came to see him. But what we realize is that the healing was at the end of it because Jesus used the healing in a way to, to bring people towards him because he wanted to heal more than bodies. He wanted to heal societies. He wanted to make his society in a place where it was fair for all, where everyone was respected, where everyone had a fair chance. And um, he began to call that God's kingdom. And indeed, that's what we can think of it as as well. Building up God's kingdom, building a place where there is respect for all, where there is reverence, where there is opportunity for all. And so the people, as I said, would start coming. They may have come by boats. As I said, there were other Jewish towns along the, the, the Sea of Galilee. They may have come by foot. They wanted to be healed. They wanted to hear more. And so Jesus begins to preach. Now, what we have in our Gospels, and particularly in Matthew's Gospel, after this, um, this period of, of people gathering in, we hear what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Now, whether that was one sermon that was said all at one time, or whether it was a collection of what people remembered and all put together. And anyway, it gives us some, some good ideas about what Jesus' message was for the people. This sermon starts with what we know as the Beatitudes, the blessed are they, and blessed, 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 blessed are they. And perhaps you have heard that before. I'm not going to read all the Beatitudes right now, but, but you will have experienced them before. I think what's interesting is that Jesus has said, these things that people would often think are curses, such as being poor in spirit, such as um, being persecuted, such as um, finding yourself in difficult situations. Things that people would normally think, ah, oh, this is a curse because I've done something wrong. Jesus kind of turns it on his head. He said, actually, these are blessings. This is a way God is blessing you. And you might think that's not exactly the way I wanted to be blessed. But what he's saying is, when you go through these difficult times, when you have persevered, when you have found a way through, when God has led you through, you become closer to God. You become closer to the people around you. And indeed, as we become closer to the people around us and closer to God, they, they go hand in hand. And so, yes, these things that we might have thought are curses were actually blessings. It's saying, too, that God cares about us in our difficult situations. And God wants to work with us to make things better, not just for ourselves, but for all God's people. I think people would have found that attractive. Indeed, we hear that the crowds kept coming. They kept wanting to hear more about these blessings that, that God 
was making in the midst of their difficulties. We're going to listen now to a hymn. It's called Blessed Are They, and it's thinking about some of these ideas um, from the Beatitudes. So listen with me.
So blessed are they, the lowly ones, the ones who show mercy, the ones who seek peace. Rejoice and be glad for these yours is the kingdom of heaven. Directly after the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel, there is a, a passage that we talk about salt and light. So listen to it now. This is Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all the house, in the, all in the house. Let In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So I wanted to think first a little bit about that first part, about you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out and trampled under foot. Now we think of salt as coming out of the salt shaker and perhaps um, mostly just to make our food taste better. But uh, salt would have had some other context, perhaps in Capernaum for those days. Uh, perhaps some of those uh, who were who were gathered would would have been thinking, well, has God blessed me to be the salt of the earth? And perhaps God, uh, Jesus was speaking about them as the salt of the earth. Certainly he's talking to people who know about salt. As I said earlier, they would have salted their fish down and someone would have uh, had to produce that salt. So probably in shallow pans that the sun would have evaporated so that there was the salt left. But then it would have also probably been mixed up with the sand. So then it's saying the salt has lost its taste. It's, it's perhaps more that it's gotten mixed up with, with everything else because, you know, salt is still salt that way. I was thinking that perhaps when King Herod had heard John the Baptist, perhaps Herod was thinking that John's words were a bit too salty. So maybe a prophecy could be salty as in making people, whew, Jump back a bit. Think, think again. Um, I wonder about if um, certainly the Capernaum folk would have known about salt as preserving and about salt as giving taste, and they would have they would have uh, valued it very much for that. I'm also thinking about that this verse starts with "You are, you are." So often in our Gospels, we're, talk, we're hearing about Jesus saying, I am, I am the light. I am the way, the truth, the love, the light. I am uh, the bread of life. And yet here Jesus is saying, you are. He's seeing something in the people there, there and he's trying to help them recognize God is at work in you. You are. We often think about too as you, you are the salt of the earth as in, you will be if you do these things, but actually saying you are the salt of the earth. God is in you. And when you are doing these things, then people can begin to taste and see a little bit what God is like. Your witness is important. And if you're not being salty, if you're not being who God needs you to be, then God's kingdom is, is deprived in that way. So even if you find yourselves in difficult situations, then persevere. Keep doing what you know is, is good and right and true. And that's how God's kingdom of love and peace and justice and joy will prevail. Again, a hymn for us. It's called The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy. Now, this particular recording that I found has the music and it has the words printed out, but it doesn't have anyone singing along. So I invite you to sing along if you like. But the hymn is The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy. Let's listen together.
for the kingdom of God is justice and joy. Kingdom of God is mercy and grace. The kingdom of God is challenge and choice. The kingdom of God is the gift and the goal. We've talked a little bit about being salt, about that everyday item that adds taste, which preserves goodness. We've talked about how Jesus says that we are salt especially when we're doing the things that promote god's kingdom of justice and, and joy and peace i want to think a few moments now about when jesus says we are the light to the nations which we take to being letting people see what we're doing whose light we're reflecting god's light but i've also been thinking about our brothers and sisters in lands where it's dangerous to stand out where it's dangerous to let their light shine. It's been two years since the military coup took over in Myanmar. And the situation there is very difficult still for our Christian siblings. February also marks out one year since Putin invaded Ukraine. Also extremely difficult time to stand out or to stand up for, for what is right. We know of situations in both um, in both of these situations where people have had to flee, physically flee, uh, or to keep their light under a bushel, so to speak, just to survive. And I think Jesus would have known something about that too, about fleeing for one's personal safety. For I knew even as an infant, we know even from Matthew's gospel that his parents had to flee with him to Egypt for their safety. We've just heard about the story where Jesus fled from Nazareth after John was arrested. So Jesus knew something about that as well. When I spoke about Myanmar two years ago, about the protesters being beaten and arrested and imprisoned and killed, we were all rightfully upset and angry at the time, and the news filled our ears, and it made our hearts cry out. I spoke at that time on the online service about how the military coup coincided with the Lunar New Year, and indeed the Lunar New Year has just ended again, and about how people at that time had taken to beating their New Year's drums, which was a traditional cultural thing they do, and Traditionally, that, those beatings of the drums had banished the demons and the dragons. And so it was a way of speaking out against injustice and making their voices heard. But then the military coup managed to control the internet and to suppress the uprisings. And it was very hard to get the information out. And outside of Myanmar, it was very hard to hear what was going on. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us lost interest. But the situation has not improved. And I have heard firsthand from several in Myanmar over recent weeks about the state of the country now. I'm told people are still regularly stopped and searched when they leave their homes to get food. One has told me he must always take his cell phone with him when he goes out. But he must make sure that his phone is cleared before he leaves home. Because the chances are that his phone will be checked and any contacts that he has on his phone will be traced. And you might say, well, just leave your phone home. He said, if he does that, he'll be challenged. Why didn't you bring your phone? It becomes a source of ID. And if he hasn't brought his phone, he'll probably be beaten. He knows of friends of his who have indeed been beaten, who've been arrested, who've been imprisoned, who've been killed. Two years on, there's little relief from the tyranny. Two years later, villages are still being burnt to the ground. Just a week or so ago, another Christian village was burnt to the ground. The churches are not exempt. In fact, sometimes they are targeted. 
because Christians have spoken out, because they've dared to continue to believe that goodness and justice and truth are important. And so the people flee to other towns and other villages, wherever they can find some safety. And some are fleeing even further, becoming refugees by whatever means they can afford. The situation in Myanmar remains bleak. As I mentioned earlier, last February also brought a new terror to the international scene as Putin invited, invaded Ukraine. And indeed, we continue to hear about that daily. We haven't been spared the images in the same way. In fact, President Zelensky has been very intent on keeping the light shining brightly from Ukraine by whatever means are necessary. And that has been part of the success in his particular battle, that the public media has, has been there and we continue to know these are the things that are going on. It's not just that villages have been burnt, but whole cities have been burnt and bombed and food and power and water and communications cut off. And people have fled to safety again, and many to our own country. Though unfortunately our own county of Kent is not accepting anymore Ukrainian refugees. I know this because my husband and I were trying to arrange um, housing for for a, a family just a few weeks ago, and we were told that Kent wasn't taking any more in because there's not any more housing or schooling places available. But these situations continue to remind us of the upheaval in the world. They continue to remind us about problems that we perhaps would rather not think about. Perhaps we think they don't really affect us. But the scriptures are clear. God holds us all responsible for each other. We are all our brothers and sisters keepers. And the responsibility for restoring and maintaining justice lies with us all. In fact, those of us with more resources have even more responsibility. Perhaps you'll remember the COP conference that took place in Egypt back in December when the richer nat nations were approached with greater responsibility to take on for the plight of the poorer nations. Again, we'd rather leave the problems to someone else, but in reality, we're all in this together. When I spoke with a friend from Myanmar a few weeks ago, he told of how the military coup was led by a person who had studied in Russia. How the Russians were blatantly funding and arming the military in Myanmar. He spoke of his dis deep disappointment when other governments were not resisting the Russian advances into Myanmar. He felt a deep connection with the people of Ukraine and he felt that their potential victory would be a victory for us all. Indeed, being part of the of the Christ body, a body that is across the world, continues to be with us. It is then our responsibility to be a light for those whose wick is dimly burning. Those of us who have voices, who have freedom, must continue to speak out, must continue to call our leaders to repentance, call our communities to repentance. We must continue to speak out on those who cannot speak out for themselves, on those whose good works continue to be done only in the dark shadows. Perhaps you're feeling a bit uneasy that I ventured into world politics here on a Sunday morning. But is that not what the gospel is about? Indeed, Jesus didn't take political situations lightly. He responded to them. He told us that the way we live in our worlds, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our church communities, is vitally important. This is where the kingdom of God is established, right here 
in our everyday lives. This is to what this is the place where we are to be salt, where we are to be adding taste, where we are to be preserving goodness in our public and our private life. This is the place where we are to be light, shining out and showing goodness that can transform darkness. I haven't heard recently from my friend from Myanmar, which probably means that communication has become even more difficult for him. I've learned that no news is not good news when it comes to me and Mark. But I realize it also means it's up to me, it's up to you to keep a light shining on injustice, to keep being salt, to keep doing the things that make people notice, the things that are good and right and true and pure, or such is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus tells us the kingdom of heaven can be here as well. For we are to be the light of the world. We are to be the salt of the earth. And God can enable that to happen with us. So be it. Amen. We'll sing together now. Show me how to stand for justice. have asked God to show us how to stand for justice, how to do what is right, how to challenge false assumptions, how to walk within the light. We will be sharing now in prayers of intercession, and as is our custom, you may write initials of persons or situations in the chat that you would like us to pray for, and we can share those with each other, though I won't be able to say them in these particular prayers. But we ask you to 
call to mind, or let God call to your mind, all those who might need our prayers today. And so we pray. Lord God, today we consider those we know around us who are in times of discomfort or dis-ease, those who are struggling. We ask you to remind us that you struggle with us, and in that struggling we can find your blessing. We know, Lord, that you don't wish any of us to to be struggling, and yet you struggle with us. And you tell us again that it's in that struggling that we can find our peace in you. Now we think of those in our world, perhaps whom we don't know personally, but those who are struggling, particularly under persecution, those who find themselves in harm's way. We lift them up, Lord. We ask you to be with them, make your presence known to them, so that they will know they do not suffer alone. Give them courage, Lord. Give them perseverance. Give them the ability to keep persevering in all that is good and right and true. We ask you to be with us too, Lord empowering us to do what we can, whatever is needed, whatever is needed for justice, whatever is needed for the public good, whatever is needed to bring joy to all your children. Lord, we hear again your call to repentance because we recognize that we haven't always done the things that you would have us to do. We ask you to help us see more clearly what we can do, what we must do, and how we can and must do it. Give us, Lord, the courage to say yes to you. We pray for our leaders, Lord, the leaders of the world's countries that they too might work for goodness, for peace, for joy, for justice for all. And where that's not happening, Lord, that there can be a time of repentance, coming back to your truth. Lord, we ask you to continue to put your spirit within us, to put your light within us, to continue to help us to be your salty people, your people of light in a dark world. And Lord, we pray these prayers as we pray the prayer that you've given us, knowing that you can and will work through us. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not to temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is Set by the Lord Am I, the hymn I like very much. It originated in the Central America. I think it was in Nicaragua at a time when there was great ah, social unrest. There was great oppression from a, an unjust government. And this was a hymn that the Christians put together. Set by the Lord am I. My hands are ready now to do the things that you need me to do. Let's sing together. Sin will. 
My hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which the kingdom comes. The angels cannot change. May the God of justice and joy, of salt and light, be with us and keep us persevering in all that is good and right and true. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs>